Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll visit in studio with newly reelected Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton, and we'll hear about a new effort to approach technology in a more holistic way. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The state is expected to save about two and a half million dollars per year over the next 13 years after refinancing the debt owed on buildings at the Capitol Mall. Arizona was able to refinance after the state's credit ratings improved. The Arizona Capital Times reports that the savings will go to the general fund in the first year and then be used to reduce rents on the Capitol buildings. And a new study shows a tougher border enforcement over the past two decades has increased the number of Mexican migrants migrants in Arizona. The study found that 33,000 more migrants came to Arizona instead of California or Texas where they might have gone without the increased enforcement. The study did not look at the impact of any enforcement action after 2011, including Arizona's Senate Bill 1070. Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton was elected to another four-year term last week. City voters also approved a tax increase and extension to expand light rail. Joining us now to continue his monthly appearances on Arizona Horizon, Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton. Good to have you back. Great to be back. Thanks Congra for having me. Congratulations on your win. Why do you think you won? Well, I think that the people of Phoenix agreed with not just my vision, but I would say our collective vision of what we want in the future of our city. We know we need to build, build a more competitive economy. Uh, and I presented a very message backed up with actions on building a more innovative economy, building a more export-based uh, economy, supporting higher education, and supporting important investments in ourselves like the future of transportation. That very positive message about how Phoenix can compete successfully in this growing competitive international economy obviously was supported by the vast majority of people of Phoenix. And I want to get to those economic ideas in a second here, but you've had your critics along the way. Why do you think that there was no serious challenge? I can't speak to that issue. I'll let other political pundits kind of make that uh, make those uh, analysis. Here's what I do. I just work hard. I present a very positive vision for the future of the city of Phoenix. I'm very present out uh, in the community and I know this community. I love this community and so I think the ideas that I have presented about how we can best compete moving forward in this competitive international economy, that's exactly what people want to want to hear. They want to believe it because they know that what has gotten us here to this point probably won't sustain us moving forward in the future. We've got to improve education. We've got to make sure more of our young people achieve a higher education. We've got to have a more innovative economy. We have to build a stronger export base in order to create jobs here. That message obviously resonates because people see it in their own lives. Uh, Phoenix seems to elect Democrats, at least uh, recently it seems to be electing Democrats. The state uh, very much the opposite. Why is that happening? Well, I, I don't think it's really a, a partisan issue per se. However, I will say that I presented a progressive message. Look, we're, we're unabashedly pro-people in the city of Phoenix. I love the people of the city of Phoenix, and we need to make sure that every single person has the best chance to succeed, no matter what neighborhood they come from, no matter their socioeconomic status, no matter whether they happen to be gay, lesbian, or transgender, regardless of religion, regardless of immigration status. If you're here, we want you to succeed because you're part of our future. We are unabashedly pro-people and we're unabashedly pro-business. Because of the pro-business policies that have been put into place since I've been mayor, the National Federation of Independent Business, which is a very conservative pro-business organization, has recently ranked Phoenix as one of the top five cities in the United States in doing business. We have tried to stand for the proposition that when you are pro-people, you are pro-business. It's a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a different governing philosophy, and it's worked very, very successfully here in Phoenix. Prop 104 passed as well. Um, were the results a little closer maybe than you expected? Uh, certainly didn't pass by as much as you did. Uh, well, no. We knew that Proposition 104 was going to be a tough election. We knew we were going to have to work incredibly hard to get the message across by, by what transportation infrastructure investment could mean to the future of our uh, economy. And we worked really hard to rally as many organizations and people as possible. The bicycle community, the transit community, the business community, the Chamber of Commerce, as you know, unanimously supported our uh, proposition. So we made the case that 
by supporting transportation infrastructure investment, you're providing so many more opportunities for people to connect to education, connect to employment centers, improving our, uh, our economy. We were able to make that case and it was a pretty big win. We got almost 56% of the vote and I'm very, very proud that the people of Phoenix overwhelmingly supported this investment in ourselves. So this investment means what? What does it mean now? What does it mean in the future? When do we see tangible results? Almost uh, immediately you're going to see improved dial ride services, improved bus services. We're working right now to uh, start the process of building a new light rail station at the Disability Empowerment Center in East Phoenix so that those that use that center can access disability services much more uh, easily. Obviously now we, we move very quickly into the process of uh, the the, the uh, construction on new light rail lines in South Phoenix and the Metro Center, when is that et cetera. Start? Well, we, we believe it's going to start by 2018 construction. So we're finishing the engineering over the next year or so, and we're going to begin construction in a pretty short period of time. The actual, the first order business, so the very first thing we're going to do is put together our citizen oversight committee. We promised people that there would be a citizen oversight committee that would ensure that uh, the transportation resources get spent in a way that maximizes the value to the people of the city of Phoenix. So you're going to see a, 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 an oversight citizen committee put in place in the next few weeks. All right. Uh, for those who didn't vote for uh, Prop 104 and who's continue to say, I don't use light rail, why should I have to pay for it? Well, because you live in this community and overwhelmingly this transportation infrastructure investment is going to advance our economy. So even if you happen to not utilize light rail, you probably know somebody that does that takes it to ASU or Grand Canyon University or to uh, uh, Gateway Community College or even to the U of A Medical School or ASU West. Even if you don't personally uh, utilize dial ride services, you probably know someone with a disability or maybe a senior that isn't comfortable driving anymore who's going to utilize dial ride so that they can advance their lives. Look, most people in the city of Phoenix don't just look at an issue and say, am I personally going to access it? The question that most people ask is, is it good for my city? Is it good for the future of my community? And obviously, overwhelmingly, the people of the city of Phoenix said, this transportation infrastructure investment is great for the future of the city of Phoenix. And oh, by the way, any person that opposed uh, Prop 104, even members of my own council, they are more than welcome to come to the numerous groundbreakings that are in occur of new businesses along the light rail line, of new uh, opportunities to bring transportation to people of South Phoenix and West Phoenix, et cetera. Look, over time, people are going to see this was a very, very wise uh, investment. So even if you voted against it or thought it wasn't the right decision now, if you change your mind, you're more than welcome to come to any of the incredible, exciting economic development opportunities that are going to be associated with this great investment that the people of Phoenix have made. A couple more election questions. Why does Phoenix hold elections in off years? So that's a, So we have held our elections during the odd number of years for as long as anyone can remember. It's a tradition of the city of Phoenix. I know some of the political commentators suggest that there's somehow something nefarious going on. The reality is, is that it's long been a multi-decades long, 40 or 50, 60 years that we have held the elections in off, in off number of years. And the main reason is so that when people vote on city issues, that's the main focus of the election is the issues related to uh, the city. I know when, they, when the elections are held uh, in the even number of years, you get involved in partisan elections and we're a nonpartisan election, will be a significantly down ballot uh, item. I support that. I think it's that, that decision by the city over many mayors, many city councils over a long period of time is the, uh, uh, is the right decision. But I think, uh, frankly, the suggestion that somehow it's a nefarious decision, nothing's changed. It's been, it's been that way for, for decades. But is it a good decision if turnout, and this last turnout was at or near 20%, I know it was 74%, something like that in 2012, it was 48%, I think, a couple of years later, at or near 20%, is that a good decision? healthy thing. Four years ago when we had a very competitive uh, mayor's election, we had a debate right here on this uh, on mm -hmm. this stage, we did have a significantly increased voter uh, turnout. It was near uh, 30 percent, which is a very high turnout for City of Phoenix elections. Look, if you can compare this election, which was a somewhat lesser, less competitive mayoral race, which often drive people to, to the ballot box, it still was significantly above average in terms of voter turnout. If you look at major cities around the country, uh, when, when Los Angeles had a, uh, a mayor's race in the middle of his term, Mayor Villaraigosa, they only got 18 uh, percent. So we're actually above the national average here in the city of Phoenix. Now, we should always look to, for ways that we can improve 
voter turnout. We've done things like creating voting centers so you can go to any of the centers across the city on Saturday, Monday, or Tuesday uh, of the election week. We've got to make it even easier for people. We've got to look at things like online voting, obviously with internet security being uh, top of mind, but look, looking to make things as easy as possible to participate in the, um, uh, in the election. But the idea that a city election would stand at the top of the ballot uh, the issues at the forefront of the city, I think, is a is a good thing for the city of Phoenix. Is it a good thing to vote during the hottest time of the year? Well, as you know, uh, the decision on the dates of the election are set by the state legislature. They require that cities have elections uh, during the August or, and November time period. If you're going to have a primary, it has to be right. in August, just like they do next year. They're going to have during next year during the presidential uh, election, they're going to have it in the August time period as well. So that would be a question of our friends at the state legislature if they wanted to give more flexibility for cities to have primaries on different election dates. Um, as far as challenges are concerned, I know you talked about the economy and uh, you want more export base and we understand that better position in the global economy, these sorts of things. Why isn't Phoenix doing better? Well, well, frankly, we are, we are doing better. As you know, uh, during my time as mayor, unemployment rate is significantly down. Our export rate, as you just saw in the paper, for Arizona and the Phoenix area in particular, is one, has, has one of the highest growth rates uh, in the entire United States of America. But still, we still, look, I'm not Pollyannish about it. Uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, where we've had an economy overly based on real estate and growth and growth on the desert's edge, we still have a lot of work to do. We've got to make sure more of our young people graduate high school and move on to college. We've got to make sure they have opportunities for innovative careers, science-based careers, technology careers here in Phoenix, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And we have to make sure that we provide as much of a marketplace for people's products and ideas. That's why building an export-based economy is so important. Another issue, though, that we have to talk even more about is water. Water is one of the greatest challenges facing not only the state of Arizona, but in particular the, the city of Phoenix. Phoenix has done a good job of water planning. I think we've talked on this show about some of the innovative things Phoenix has done, partnering with Tucson and allowing our CIP water to be stored in aquifers down in southern Arizona, doing things like the Colorado River Resiliency Fund, where we work on forest restoration in northern Arizona, paid for by Phoenix ratepayers of our, of our water rate. But we, we have to be even more innovative and come up with new ideas to better work on conservation and protecting our long-term water uh, positions. That's one of the biggest challenges facing the future of our city. Another big challenge is the, uh, the budget, uh, the deficit, the structural deficit. I mean, things uh, were, I know you balanced this time around, but the forecast for the next few years is not good. What are you going to do? Well, we, we're going to do in future years exactly what we've done during my time as mayor. There's a reason why Phoenix, a very fiscally well-run city, has the highest credit rating of any of the big six cities in the United States of, of America. So we are a, we are a fiscally well-run city. But when we have noticed that in years ahead we might have deficits, we roll up our sleeves. Because we're a conservative government, we tend to overestimate those potential deficits, so we prepare for them. And then we make the necessary choices. Major pension reform like we have done, the, the, the size of our city government has shrunk on a per capita uh, basis. Efficiency uh, efforts, innovation efficiency efforts led by Councilman Bill Gates have been hugely successful, saving over $100 million. And so in years past, when we were projected to have a budget deficit this year, there was no budget, budget deficit. We made those tough choices early enough to provide that balanced budget. And that's exactly what we're doing for future years. So I'll come back, I'll hopefully be back on every month and we can report on our, our budget and the success of our budget. And I, I'm telling you now, we're gonna come back and predict a balanced budget next year's and the remaining four years that I'm mayor of the city of Phoenix. Without service cuts? We've done it without service cuts. Yep. But can you continue to do that? Yes, we're gonna to continue to do that with service cuts. This, this effort that we've made, on innovation and efficiency has been spectacular and that is going nowhere but up in terms of how we provide a better government with smaller resources without people in the community uh, really seeing it. And in fact, our citizen survey of customer satisfaction has been the best that it's ever been the last two years that we've, we've, done, that, uh, we've done that survey. The pension reform that the people of Phoenix overwhelmingly supported in 2013 really starts to kick in. We just got started with it. As it kicks in more and more, you're going to see greater savings in our budget. We do need, though, pension reform from the state, from the governor and the legislature as it relates to public safety pension reform in order to relieve much of the pressure on our budget. And they ought to look to the city of Phoenix, our leadership, what we did in pension reform, as a way to deal with the very difficult issue of public safety pension reform. Last question before you go. Arizona is looking to rebrand 
its image. Does Phoenix need to rebrand its image? Well, I think that's exactly what we've been doing during my time as mayor. I mentioned City of Phoenix is pro-people. You want progressive pro-people policies, look to the City of Phoenix. We got a 100% score from the Human Rights Campaign for our pro-LGBT community policies, the same as any other big city in, in, the, in the country. I've tried to stand for the principle working with Councilman Kay Gallego on equal pay for equal work. We passed a new ordinance in that regard. We stand for comprehensive immigration uh, reform. Some of this rhetoric that you're hearing uh, nationally as it relates to birthright citizenship, kind of in a negative attitude towards our local Latino community. You don't hear that from, we're supportive of our local community and we're pro-business and we're taking a much stronger. So I would politely suggest that actions speak louder than words and instead of a rebranding campaign, pass policies that really support your local economy, improve education, reinvest in education, do what we've done, reinvest in innovative uh, uh, public policies, work on building a more export-based economy, and the results will speak for themselves. You won't have to do a, uh, a rebranding in words. Sounds like you're happy enough with the branding so far. We're, we are, as a city of Phoenix, we're moving in the right direction. I think we are making a lot of progress. When I, be, when I was uh, elected mayor, there was a book that said that we were the least sustainable city in the entire uh, country, a book called Bird on Fire by Andrew Ross. Just recently, City of Phoenix won first place for sustainability by the U.S. Conference of Mayors, their highest award. We are making progress and we're starting to take notice on a national level by the progress we're making here in Phoenix, Arizona. There's an optimism here in Phoenix and I think Tuesday's results are in part based upon people's optimistic view of our position moving forward. Mayor, good to have you here. Thank you so much. <laughs>
the kinds of social questions that might be. What might uh, transportation planning look like if we have to pay attention to automobiles that are being driven not by human beings but by computers? What might revenue from uh, automobiles uh, to the city for fines and things like that look like? But also things like genetics and synthetic biology where people are attempting to design new organisms that have not been uh, conditioned by evolution before uh, for medicines, for agriculture, for the larger economy, a whole host of new technologies and a set of older technologies that we haven't quite fully grappled with, say nuclear energy. In, indeed, how do you though, how do you handle a prediction or at least a, a readiness for the future of technology and innovation when technology and innovation is changing so fast. The goalposts are moving all the time. So the point is actually to get away from that uh, that idea of prediction. That's sort of out the window. We believe that we you know we can't predict where it's going to go, but there are decisions that we can make today that will help prepare us for any kind of plausible future that we might face. And so among the things that you want to do is sit down with scientists and engineers who are working on the technical side with folks who might be the users of these uh, technologies that they have in mind, uh, bring social scientists and humanists into the mix so we get a broad perspective, and talk about the kind of futures that we want. And once we set some goals about the things that we want, we might be able to make some better decisions now about how to get there. And I guess one of the, again, challenges of innovation is sometimes innovation moves faster than society can adapt. Well, I actually don't like to take that position because What's innovation? Innovation is a set of choices that people are making about the things that they want to do new in the world technologically. And if people are making those choices, innovation isn't moving any faster than the rest of society because it comes out of society. But there's, but, but there's talk now that people, people are, the, the social media phenomenon mm -hmm. is turning, it's almost changing the, the human dynamic. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the genetics are almost changing because we're doing things that we just haven't done before. Uh, a lot of folks are saying society hasn't adapted all that well to all aspects of social media. I wouldn't disagree with that, but the, the question is not to let the, the rhetoric of technology moving faster than society prevent us from saying, hey, wait a minute, these are choices that individual human beings and that groups of human beings make, and maybe we ought to think about making those choices slightly differently. Do you have to then uh, look ahead? I know you don't want to predict, mm -hmm. but do you have to uh, monitor and say, what we're doing on this track over here could be harm. Let's move tracks. Yeah, I think that's one of the things you have to do. And the word that we like to use there in place of, uh, in place of prediction is anticipation, which sort of literally means building the capacity now to do something that's looking toward the future. All sounds great, all sounds interesting and promising, but what about the human factor? The human factor. Well, this is you know part of what we're supposed to be training uh, our students into and, and doing the research. And right now, you know, universities like to talk about being oriented toward the future, but no university in the United States has really made the future a specific focus of inquiry and education. Universities like to say that they're innovative engines. Absolutely, but no university in the United States has really made the societal aspects of innovation a particular focus. Universities like to think that they're about um, integrating their activities uh, with a broader society, and what we're after is putting that social fabric directly into the decisions that we're making around knowledge-based innovation. So last question here, what exactly will students learn and how much real-world application will be involved? Well, we hope there's going to be a lot of real-world application. We have a very active vision of learning. Students that we currently have do a lot of internships and, and work in the private sector as they're getting their degrees. We really envision students going into all sorts of different kinds of positions as well as being grounded citizens that are prepared for a more technologically intensive future because really along with the idea that ASU has about access, the future is really for everyone and we want to help prepare everyone for the future. Sounds like bottom line getting science and democracy, technology, innovation, society, all of them to fit together. Exactly. And that's the plan. And the school starts? We have opened our doors as, a, as the School for the Future of Innovation in Society this semester. We have a host of uh, graduate students in four different graduate degree programs, and we'll be introducing our undergraduate program next fall. All right. Very good. Good to have you here. Thank you so much. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you.
And Tuesday on Arizona Horizon, we will hear how small businesses can better protect their intellectual property and we'll look at an effort to help promote civil discourse among political leaders. It's 5 30 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon. A reminder if you want to check out previous programs, watch this episode again, or see what we have in store for the future, you can check us out at azpbs.org slash horizon. That's azpbs.org slash horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. ASU's Ira A. Fulton Schools of Engineering strive to advance research, education, and industry to transform our economy. Ideas, talent, and technology for Arizona. You can learn more at engineering.asu.edu/tv.